Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we praise you because you're always worthy. Now, Lord, we ask that you would come before us, that you would shape us and mold us and make us. We ask that you would help us to surrender and submit, Lord. You are the potter with the clay. Yeah. So shape us and mold us, Father. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's a good thing that we serve a good God. Amen? Amen. We serve a good God, and because we serve a good God, we can never be in a bad situation. I want to make sure we're talking about religious liberty, and we're going to deal with some different aspects of religious liberty during our time together, because God wants us to understand that it is time for us to look at religious liberty from a different perspective. We have been looking at religious liberty as something that is our right. And God wants us to, and, that, and it was right to look at religious liberty as our right. But now we want to move from religious liberty being our right. Because when something is your right, then that means somebody has to give it to you or somebody can withhold it from you. And I want you all to know that we are moving into a season in Earth's history, in church's history, where we're going to have to do what we have to do, whether somebody gives us the right or not. Amen. So we're going to talk about a different type of religious liberty today. Three types of religious liberty. We're going to begin with religious liberty in the heart. Then we're going to deal with religious liberty in the home. And then we're going to deal with religious liberty in the church. Today, um, this particular segment, we're going to be dealing with religious liberty from the heart. So what we want to do, because we are Bible believers, one thing God is helping me to understand in this great transition, and I want to make sure, uh, Pastor Coleman, that we see this as what it is. This is a transition. This is a transition. It is not from God. He's going to use it. This pandemic, this pandemic, it did not come from him. Amen. But in the words of Joseph, when his brothers who were scared to death because daddy had now died and they thought that now Joseph was about to bring retribution on them for what they did, Joseph said, what the devil thought for evil, God meant for good. Oh, Jesus. I, I want to make sure that we understand those two words. The devil had a thought that this was something that was going to hinder God's people, that was going to destroy God's people. So he came up with a thought, but God used that thought for an intention. He said, God meant it. For good, and I want you all to know it. West Side Seventh Day Adventist Church, the pandemic is going to be one of the best things that ever happened to you because you're going to get religious freedom out of this so called bondage. Amen. But it's going to have to start in your heart, it's going to have to start in your heart. So, what we've got to do is we've got to see what God calls religious liberty. I don't know, Brother Tate, but maybe you've run into these people, but there is a, there's a segment of people now that are against religion. Mm -hmm. not, not the way you think. There are people who say, you know what, I'm not religious. I, I want to be spiritual. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what they've said is that religion is a bad thing, and you know why religion is a bad thing? Because religion represents rules and guidelines and structure, and, and the spiritual people, so-called, don't want guidelines and rules and structure. But I believe we should go to God's word. James, the first chapter, verses 26 and 27. James, the first chapter, verses 26 to 27. And we're going to get what God's view, what God's definition of religion is. Is that all right? Because if anybody knows what religion is, it would be God. And we want to make sure that we have his definition down for what religion is so we can do like that bird and just jet when we need to jet. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. James the first chapter. James the first chapter verses 26 and 27 as we read with Holy Ghost eyes. It says, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart, 
this man's religion is vain. We got two mm -hmm. definitions of religion right there. God says a truly religious person can bridle their tongue. A truly religious person lets the Holy Ghost tell them what to say and what not to say. In this same book, going to the next chapter, he actually says if any man can bridle his tongue, he says any sin he'll be able to let God give him the victory over. So religion is about allowing the Holy Spirit to be the one that talks to you. Number two, it says that you cannot allow the devil to work through your heart to fool you. It says that if his heart deceives him, then his religion is vain. His religion is foolish, which means what? In order to be religiously free, I've got to look into that Holy Ghost mirror and let the Lord show me who I really am. I can't truly be free until I know truly who I am. Then, and only then, can I sing that song I was singing deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. That's when you've looked at your mirror. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. See, until your cry is one of despair, until your cry is one of, Lord have mercy, it's just, I don't think you can do this. I'm too bad. I've done too many bad things. When you can cry like that, then he comes like that. Did you hear what right. the Lord? But until then, your religion is in vain. When you can look your nose down on somebody else, when you can be like that man in Luke the 18th chapter and say, Lord, I'm so thankful that I'm not as other men are. But the Bible says that man prayed to himself. His prayer never even got out of the church. You've got to have a clear understanding of who you are not before God can make you who you were born to be. I'm talking about religious liberty. Verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The next two aspects of true religion, number one, you gotta let the Holy Ghost have your tongue. That's right. That's right. Number two, you gotta let the Holy Ghost show you who you are and who you are not. Amen. Number three, you've got to have a burning desire yes. to meet the needs of anybody in trouble. That's, 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 it said if your religion is pure, yes. then I can't be the priest or the Levite. Did somebody hear what the Lord just said? See, those good Seventh-day Adventists, they were on their way, not to West Side, though. They were on their way to somewhere else. But they, they, they were on their way to Sabbath school, and they saw somebody in need. And it says the priest, the priest saw the person in need and kept on going, wouldn't even go to the other side. But but the Levite at least went over there and saw his condition, but he had to get to church, so he, he couldn't help him. But there was a half-breed, hallelujah. There was somebody, there was this Samaritan that the Jews looked down upon. He was the one that was free. I need somebody to understand what God is saying today. If you are so holy, if you are so religious, that you can't help somebody in need, yes. Yes. then God says there'll be no religious liberty for you. Amen. 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 See, it doesn't matter how many great controversies I pass out. That's wrong. That's wrong. I need you to hear what the Lord is saying right now. See, Peter thought he was free, but he was bound up. Jesus, he thought he was free. He was so free in his mind that he called our Lord and Savior a lie. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. You say, well, when did he do that? Peter said, Peter said, you know, I'll do anything for you. He said, Peter, you're not as strong as you think you are. He said, matter of fact, before the club comes up, you're going to say, you don't even know me. And he said, they'll all forsake you. I'll never forsake you. You know what the Bible said? You know what the Bible said? So then when the Bible says that that night went a mob, a throng, of no good, dissolute, angry, reprobate men came with instruments to get your Lord and Savior. Peter said, I'm going to show you how free I am. I'm going to show you that with insurmountable odds, 
I'm willing to fight for you. There's somebody in here like that right this minute that you say, I'll fight, I'll face the mob. But God said, but the mob's not your test. God says, I don't, I don't always want you to fight for me. I don't want you to be willing to go to jail for me. Let me determine what the test is. And that same fearless Peter, Lord have mercy, that same, I'll do anything for you, Peter, now that Jesus is arrested. I'm trying to help y'all understand something. See, religious liberty means you've got to be free enough to understand when it's not going right, Jesus is still in control. See, he couldn't handle that Jesus is now arrested, and now this brave man, Lord have mercy, this brave man is by the fire. Well, what's wrong with being by the fire? That's not where Jesus was. See, John was free. Jesus was in trouble, and John was all right to let everybody know, I'm with the one in trouble. I'm with him. But Peter's over here by the fire. So now, with no sticks and stones, no, no weapons of instruments, all somebody said was say, what you with? Didn't I see you? With, with that man on trial? Not me. Not me. Three different times. He had to use profanity to let them know I'm not one of them. But I need to give you all this quick hallelujah moment right here. See, when you're truly free, we're talking about heart work today. When you're truly free because Jesus is our pattern, when somebody has done you completely wrong, you must let the Holy Ghost walk yes. to work through yes. you Amen. to get them out of trouble. You didn't hear what I said. Desire page just says that Peter was on his way to do the same thing that Judas did. When he realized, man, I am exactly who Jesus says I was. And Jesus stopped being arrested. Hallelujah. This is, this is my divine revelation of it. Jesus stopped. He said, I know y'all got to do something, but one of my boys is in trouble. So he turned around and with his eyes. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? With his eyes. Anybody here old enough to remember when parents used to teach children and control children with their eyes? Y'all understand what that's like? You be at church cutting all up and, and, and you felt the eyes in the back of your head. Mercy, mercy, I'm in trouble. I don't want to look, but I got to look. And you turn around and the said, don't make me come up there. Amen. Not a word was spoken. Do you all hear what the Lord said? So Jesus turned around and in those eyes, see, this is how we've got to get. Because our eyes will say, I told you so. Our eyes will say, you no good down here. After all I've done for you, I'll let you walk on the water for me. And this is how, with me. And you're going to do me like that. But that's not freedom. That's not religious freedom. He turned around and with his eyes, he turned around and said, it's going to be all right. He turned around and said, remember what the last part of that word I said to you was, and when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Beloved, in order to have heart religious freedom, we've got to get to the point. Watch this. We've got to get to the point where I'm all right with my past. You thought I was going to talk about somebody else. See, there's somebody that the reason you can't go forward is because the devil keeps reminding you of what you did. Right. Right. And as long, please hear what the Lord is saying, I can't be free as long as the devil can tap me on the shoulder and say, you remember what you did? And, and, and the liar, please hear this, the liar doesn't have to lie. Because because he's got truth to remind you That's of. Right. That's right. You did do it. Yeah. You did say it. You were low down and no good. And all he does is remind you of what you did. But you have got to be able to say, he told me in 1 John 1, 9, that we confess our sins. Yes. He is faithful and just yes. to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But he also told me in Isaiah 43, 25, that I, the Lord God, I blot out your transgressions for my name's sake, and I will remember your sins no more. Amen. Amen. Wait a minute. Amen. Amen. I'm talking about getting free in your heart. Yes. I'm talking about there are people who can quote scriptures, some of your best preachers and Bible workers, some of your people who can give powerful Bible studies, people who can sing like an angel, but they can't get away from guilt. And in order for us to be religiously 
free in order for us to have the liberty that God wants us to have. We're going to have to take him at his word. Yes. What does that mean? He said, if you come to me, he says, I won't just take care of that one. <laughs> he said, I'll forgive you of your sins and I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Yes. So as I heard somebody say the other day, trust the process. Trust the process. Part of looking in the mirror helps us to understand how messed up we are. And therefore, I shouldn't think that I'm going to arrive anytime soon. Did y'all hear that? Pastor? <laughs> I don't understand why I'm not here yet. <laughs> Preach it. Yeah. I'm, I'm just amused. My personal amusement. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to give you my personal quick one minute testimony. All right. See, I want y'all to understand something. I've been so messed up that I, I believe, from my point of view, that two or three lifetimes is not enough time for God to get me to look just like Him. So I just have to trust Him. My church members know my favorite scripture is Philippians 1, 6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you. Hallelujah. He's able to perform it. He said, Derek, I couldn't even call it a finish in you because what I got to do in you is going to be a performance. Did you hear, hear what the Lord said? This is what you got to understand. So I'm free. I need y'all to understand something. I'm free. I'm not what I want to be. Tremaine used to sing a song, I'm not what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. Hallelujah. I'm changed, and I'm going to keep on changing because I plan on being. Yes. Thank you. Amen. I, I'm going to say it like this. I plan on making the team. Mm -hmm. Amen. Preach it. There's a team that we've got to make. You know, we don't believe in competition like that, but there is a team you're going out for right now. You're going out for that squad. Mm -hmm. Amen. That squad that's going to give the loud cry. Yes. Because the loud cry has got to be given by perfect people. The loud cry has got to be given by people that have overcome every besetment of sin. I'm trying to help you all understand who Jesus is. Yes. Jesus says, I understand that everybody can't make the team. And just because you can't make the team doesn't mean you don't get the prize. I'm trying to help you all understand. There's going to be a lot of people that die in Jesus, but they're going to go to the same heaven you go to. But God says, but it's just going to be a certain group of folk. And what I'm trying to help you all to understand this morning is that vegan vegetarianism, clap, clap. <laughs> <laughs> and I am a vegan vegetarian, okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't eat between meals, two meals a day, this, that, and the other. I, I, he, he brought me here to tell you all, he says that's no. not the way to your life. Preach. Come on. Oh, he's preach. Preach. That's not me talking. Matthew 23, 23 says you pay tithes of mint, anise, and coming. See, he went there, Pastor Coleman, because you know we think we're something because we're faithful with our tithes. So he said, let me tell you something. You can be paying tithes of mint, anise, and coming. That means they count the little leaves. I'm not, I wouldn't steal not one penny from the Lord. Hmm. He said, yeah, but you're still in my glory every day Amen. because you mean and nasty acting because you won't forgive yourself. You won't forgive. See, when you can't forgive yourself, listen to the news flash. If you won't forgive yourself, you won't forgive anybody else. You're not capable of forgiving anybody else. So guilt written people. It's hard to get along with guilt guilt-ridden people. So in order to be religiously free, the very first thing that I have to do is I have to accept the fact that God says I am able. Yes. I, let, let me say it to you like this. God wants you to know he got more than you have. He has more than you have. What, what are you talking about? That's right, what are you talking about? Romans 5 20 says we're set abounds. Mm -hmm. Grace, much more. Is that, I think I heard, what, what did that say? <laughs> it says, when you got a whole bunch of grace, abounding, that's, that's abundant. you got lots of sin. He says, I don't have as much grace as you've got sin. He says, I've got much more grace than you've got sin. That's what it says, because you must understand that God is a God of abundance. There's somebody maybe right in here right now that you love just getting just enough. Mm -hmm. mm. Folk oh, come over your house. How many are there? We won't have baked potatoes. There's six people. You're going to give to six baked potatoes. Because you're just going to meet the mark. But I want you all to understand that that's 
not who God is. Psalm 23, 6 says, when you're in trouble, thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup, what does it do? Runs it runs over. Come on, come on. He, he tells me, give and it shall be given to you. Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Is that what it says? Amen. Yes, amen. When he fed the 5,000, did everybody get just enough? <laughs> it was 12 baskets full left over. This is who God is. If you want to be like God, I'm sorry, take that back. Since you want to be like God, <laughs> then you've got to start operating in the abundance. And before you start operating in the abundance with your material stuff, he says operate in the abundance in the spiritual things. Start with mercy. Start with forgiveness. Be abundant with your mercy. Be abundant with your forgiveness. If you want forgiveness, if you want to be spiritually free. Mm. You know, some of us, we we real faithful stewards about our mercy. We don't give it out that often. Mm. Acting like you don't have enough. Mm. <laughs> Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, he says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power that worketh in you. Wait a minute. So he said, I got all you need. I just need you to let me work in you. Mm. That's right. Amen. Yes. So I go to church on the right day. I try to eat the right stuff, try to dress the right way. But I don't treat people right. Mm -hmm. Matthew 23, 23, again, we move past the tithe. You pay tithe if men and it's coming, but you omit grace. That's a big word. It doesn't say you're a little short. He said you omit. Mm. <laughs> it's not even in your life. Mm. The weightier matters of the law. Mm. Just judgment, mercy, mm. and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. He said, I want you to, re I want you to return to time. I want you to eat right. I want you to dress right. He says, but I, I, I used to be an educator. I, I really am still an educator. But, but, and you know, there are certain aspects of information that have more weight on a test than others. Because, you know, we were Kind of slipping and sliding in school, we would ask the teachers, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> I'm not concerned about any information that I'm not going to be tested on. And I want you to understand something. I want you to understand something, Sister Bonnie. Um, we think that's a bad thing. Oh, man, that's a bad student. But I want you to understand something. When you are in a curriculum, when you are in a system that specializes in giving you unnecessary information, Hmm. You need to make sure you're not holding on to any more unnecessary information than you need to. Mm -hmm. Are you going to test me on this mess? Because if you're not going to test me on this mess, I don't even want to know this mess. But I need you to understand, as it relates to God, if he tells you, it's going to be on the test. Mm -hmm. Anything he gives you is going to be on the test. Right. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? If it's in his word, it's going to be on the test. And he says, what you must do is you must learn how to dispense judgment. You know, I believe right under, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And John 3, 16, um, for God so loved the world. I think the next most quoted scripture in Christianity is Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged. <laughs> Anytime somebody says that, you know, we, you, you know, we shouldn't judge. Mm -hmm. Say, so, you know, sister, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, brother, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, we shouldn't be judged. But I'm here to tell you about liberty today. Religious liberty. Do you know that, number one, we're misquoting that scripture because Matthew 7, 1 and 2 didn't say don't judge. What Matthew 7, 1 and 2 says is how you judge is how you're going to be judged. It says, for with what measures ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. But in John 7, 24, it says, judge not according to appearance, 
but judge righteous judgment. What does that say, Brother Tate? What does that say? It says, no, no, no. I want you to judge. I just want you to step into the spirit enough. I need you to be connected to me enough that you can look past the outward appearance and see what the true assessment of this individual is. Amen. He said, that's judgment. He said, and then when you can judge right, automatically you're going to need some mercy. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And then when you get some, some mercy, then, then you're going to say, well, Lord, you know, how much mercy am I going to need? He says, faith. Hmm. Have faith that you can't go wrong being merciful if I tell you to be merciful. Did you hear that? This is what God wants us to understand. And so when we're dealing with this heart work, it is important for us to realize that what we've got to be after is looking like Jesus on the inside. inside. Yes. Amen. Amen. I gotta pray for Pastor Coleman, Elder Coleman, saying it like that for a reason. Because I know what it's like to start off as an elder and then become a pastor to the same people. That's hard work right there, brother. <laughs> there are certain people that won't let you make the transition. I'm not telling you what I read in the Bible, okay? I'm telling you what I live. Okay, you when if they'd have brought somebody in, it'd have been a whole other story. But because wait a minute, you were one of us. You you might have you know led out and this that and the other, but you were one of us. And now nah, I've got people to call me brother Sharp. Won't call me Pastor Sharp. And what you got to do is say that's all right because I don't need your title. Because the only thing the title does is give you more responsibility. So so so. Really, you can call me Brother Sharp, and then maybe I can forget how much responsibility I have. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? It's just like the person who gets a doctor, and, they, and you were Tom all your life, and now you got to be Dr. Tom. <laughs> Doesn't matter about your title. Amen. Just be faithful. That's right. I mean, the Lord's about to free somebody right now. You know what? I, I've been successful my whole life. I've been good at what I did by the grace of God my whole life until I became a pastor. <laughs> When I became a pastor, I said, Lord, I can't do anything right. This is, nothing's doing good. I'm preaching my little heart out and the folks not changing and nothing's going on. I said, Lord, I'm a failure. And God says, come here, come here. I'm still getting some of that worldly education out of you. Listen, he's about to set somebody free right now. Christians don't go after success. Let me say that one more time. Christian, a Christian is not supposed to be successful. A Christian is supposed to be faithful. And you leave the success to God. See, what we want to do is we want to see some results from what we're doing. And God says, I'm not always going to show you the results. I just need you to do what I told you to do. He took me to the most awesome pastor in the Bible. What's that be? First mega pastor. That would be Moses. He pastored a million member church. <clears throat> but guess what, Sister Brian? He wasn't successful. His job, his job, Brother Tate, was to get his flock to the promised land. Well, what did he do? He got them there and couldn't convince them to go in. <laughs> so then he had to turn around and go back into the wilderness Watch them die. Listen to what the Lord is saying. And, and God purposefully wouldn't give him the correct understanding of a message. Oh, I'm trying to help you all right now. When they were going back, what did God say? He said, of those who are over 20, the only two, he said, the only people who are going to go into the promised land are Joshua and Caleb. You know what your Bible said? Did Moses hear that? Did Moses hear that, Sister Bond? Did he hear that the only people over 20 who are going to go into the promised land were Joshua and Caleb? Well, what did you think? What did Moses say? He said, that's right. Of all y'all, of all y'all no good, wouldn't even want to go in when it was time to go in. You not going to go. Nobody's going to go in but of y'all, but Joshua and Caleb. But God said, that's not what I said. He said, I said, nobody. 
That meant you. That meant Aaron. That meant Miriam. It says none of you all. Please hear what God wants you to understand. Sometimes God in his mercy, he won't let you understand something because you leave him if you understood it. Did you hear what He says, not time yet. You got to go through some things. So then he gets there the second time and the folk hear me, Pastor. And the folk make him mad. And then he hits the rock. And then he can't go in. Lord have mercy. I don't plan on hitting the rock. Amen? Amen? I don't plan on hitting the rock. I don't plan on hitting the rock. But but guess what? You've got to understand that Moses, when you look at his objective, he was not successful. But he's in heaven right now because he was faithful. Did you hear know what the Lord said? Stop being result oriented. God says that you must realize, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, it says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. What, what, what were we supposed to be doing with the works of the Lord? Being abounding. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain, in the Lord. It doesn't matter if you see it or not. It doesn't matter if you feel it or not. It doesn't matter if you hear it or not. Don't be successful. Be faithful. Because when you are faithful, you are free. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? When you're faithful, then you're free. But I don't see any results. He said, well, I guess I don't want you to see any results right now. I want you to work on your faith. See, the fact that you don't see it and that's impacting you, is saying that you're not full of faith. That's all faithful means, it's full of faith. Stop being like Peter and try and prove to the Lord how good you are. And walk in the fact that you're not. I've come to understand that the moment I take my hand out of God's hand, mm. I'm capable of doing anything That's right. That's the devil will let me do, That's right. that he'll cause me to do. I'm not better than anybody. My message isn't better than anybody's. My gift isn't better than anybody's. I've just been given some grace from God. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? I've just been here. And so it allows me to be free in Jesus. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? This is what he wants us to embrace. So what he needs us to deal with is what Moses did. Lord, will you show me this? Go with me to Exodus, the 33rd chapter. We're talking about you got to get free in your heart. You got to get free in your heart. And then once you get free in your heart, then you can get free in your home. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? And then when we get free in our home, then we can get free in our church. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? Amen. Then we can take it to the devil. That's right. That's right. Amen. Exodus, the 33rd chapter. We're going to read verses 13, 18, and 19. Exodus, the 33rd chapter. Don't you, don't you think I'm just talking to pastors? I'm talking to members. I'm talking to everybody. Because what Moses did, we're going to have to do, and we're going to have to go past Moses. Mm -hmm. See, the Psalm 77, 13 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, right? Yes. Once you all understand, I had to change how I saw things. Uh, 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 you know, you look at the courtyard as the courtyard, but according to Leviticus 6.26, write it down. In Leviticus 6.26, the courtyard is the holy place. That's right. See, you can't come into Jesus and there not be some level of holiness. There is no time where you come into Jesus and holiness is not required. Right. So in the courtyard is holy. Then you go to the holier place and then you go finally to the most holy place. But it's all about holiness. That's, right. That's his way. His way is a progressive way. Somebody should say hallelujah. I'm so glad, Lord, that you don't require, require it all of me in one day. Amen. He says, but I do require it of you. That's right. Look at Moses. Exodus 33. He's gotten to the point <clears throat> where he doesn't think, Pastor Coleman, that he's cut out for the calling. <clears throat> 
He got the information, but he realizes, Brother Tate, I need something else. I sure hope somebody's hearing what the Lord said. It's some pastors right now. It's some husbands right now. It's some wives right now. It's some fathers right now. It's some mothers right now. It's some children right now because there's some children that is your calling to save your parents. I'm not talking about grown children. I'm talking about there's some parents that God had the parents have you because he knew you would be what would get them to him. That's right. Right. And so, but, but, but because we're trying to be successful, mm-hmm. we say, Lord, this isn't working. This isn't working. And so Moses reached a this isn't working moment. And here's the solution. This is how you get religious liberty in your heart. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? Look what it says. Verse 13, verse 13. Now, therefore, I pray thee. If I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. That. In other words, he needs to know God's way so three things can take place. Look at He said, number one, I need to know your way that I may know thee. Number two, that I may find, that I may find grace in thy sight. Number two, and look at number three, and consider that this nation is thy people. Lord, have mercy. He said, there's got to be something. Thank you so much. There's got to be something. There's got to be something that I'm missing because I'm not able to see these people as your people. Did y'all get that? There's got to be something because I can't see my husband as one of your people. I can't see my wife as one of your people. I can't see these knucklehead children as ever growing up and be about something. And God said, what what I put within you, Moses, is that I'm going to have to show you my way. Did y'all get that? Jesus. Moses has studied the Sabbath school lesson every Sabbath from birth. He was even studying it when he was in Egypt. He knew the doctrine. But doctrine wasn't helping him view the people right. Did y'all hear that? So he said, what I need is your way. That's verse 13. In verse 18, he said, I need you to show me your glory. So we get a definition of what God's way is. God's way is his glory. And then in verse 19, he says, I will answer your prayer, and I will proclaim unto you the name of the Lord. Did y'all catch that? So God's way is his glory. God's glory is his name. And in Exodus 34... Verses 5 to 7, somebody needs to pray the prayer. Lord, take me to the cleft of the rock. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? I'm not going to be free until I can get to the cleft of the rock. And I can hear you proclaim your name. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and who by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I want you all to understand something. I always call that God's ingredients label. And when you understand the law of ingredients, what's in there the most is what's lifted first. He said, the Lord, the Lord God. What's the first thing he put in there? What's what's God? He's mostly mercy. Mm -hmm. Grace. Long suffering. He said, God said, the way that you can look at a wayward person as still being one of my people is you got to have lots of mercy. Yes, yes. You've got to have lots of grace. You've got to have lots of long suffering. I'm not talking about compromise. See, the Pharisees are like, oh, mm, you just. Have... We love cry loud, spare not. Show my people their sin. But what God wants you to understand is that there are various ways to show people their sins. Yeah. And one of the best ways to show people their sins is to live sin free in front of them. That's right. Amen. 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 See, see, 
I, I had a friend of mine, she used to send uh, emails, and, and the email at the end, it says, preach the gospel, use words if you must. Let me say this. That would pass somebody. It said, preach the gospel, yes. use words if you must. Yes. See, see, God says, I'd rather see a sermon yes. than hear one any day. Yes. I'd rather one would walk with me yes. than merely show the way. For the eyes are better pupil, more willing than the ear. Find counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. Yes. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creed. But to see yes. the good in action is what everybody needs. I can soon learn how to do it if you let me see it done. Yeah. I can watch your hand in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my message by observing what you do. For I may misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. Yeah. Beloved, this is religious liberty in my heart. God says, I need my people to start having a burning desire. Yes. Watch what the Lord yes. says. To know me instead of knowing about me. Amen. Mm. 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 Now, I need you all to love me just for a minute, sister body. I need you all to just, just trust me for, for just a minute because I preached Pastor, Pastor Coleman, and, and what I'm about to say has run me out of some pulpits. <laughs> So I need y'all to just be with me just for a moment. Just bear with me. Exercise a little patience just for a moment, all right? God said, what I want my people to do is I want you to close the book. Y'all say, okay, we trying. We trying, Pastor. We trying, we trying, we trying. We made an idol out of the Bible. We are tremendous researchers. Everything there is to know in the Bible, you think you know. But I want you all to understand something. God did not give you this as the end all be all. The Bible is not the answer to every problem you have. The Bible is not what you're supposed to go to every time you need instruction. Oh boy, I see somebody got the rope up there. <laughs> Ain't that man? What in the world is going on? But John 5 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. The eternal life. They testify of me. He says, You think eternal life is in the Bible. The Bible points you to me. Yes, amen. Amen. Let me tell you what most Christians don't have today. That's why they're not religious free, religiously free. We don't have a walk with the Lord that allows us to hear his voice clearly. Amen. You can quote scripture day and night. You say, when's the last time you heard from the Lord? <laughs> well, oh, oh. Job 13, 15 says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Amen. Well, how would he told Job? <laughs> and I re and that really ain't what he told Job. That's what Job told him. I'm saying, when was the last time you heard from the Lord? Not what you thought you did, you did. Right. Because, beloved, God wants you all to understand, in order to be religiously free in your heart, you've got to have a relationship with God Amen. that allows you to talk to him, Amen. but more importantly, yes, for him to talk to you. Yeah. Let me just make it practical so y'all can put your rope up, okay? Because some of y'all still looking at me like, oh, Pastor Shop, I don't know. I need y'all to understand something. You're dealing with country living, okay? We've heard you're supposed to move to the country. You're supposed to move to the country. What scripture would tell you where to go? What script, what, what, where in your Bible do you turn to tell you whether it's supposed to move north, south, east, west? Whether you're going to stay in Indiana, move to another state, it's not in there. Hmm. So what you're going to do? You need some information. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. I'm here to tell you where you're going to get that information, where you're going to move. <laughs> what scripture are you going to go to when you say, Lord, I love this person. Uh, uh, she believes the same way I do. He believes the same way I do. What scripture says you need to marry them? It's not in there. Lord, I need to quit my job. Lord, is this the job for me? Lord, this employer is getting on my nerves. Lord, you've got to have a relationship with 
the Lord because when you can't hear from him, you don't have any religious liberty. Did y'all hear what the Lord said? You are chained by the Bible. You can hear what I said. You can tell about what you... Lord, you want me to say that? I got to, I got to stop that. See, we can tell people anything that's in the Bible. But God says in every church, you know what the Lord says, in every church, there's got to be somebody that can tell you something that's not in the Bible. Hmm. Hmm. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 14. Help me, Lord. 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to let you go. 1 Corinthians 14. Help me, Jesus. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. And we want to look prayerfully at verse. We want to look prayerfully at verse 6. I'm going to tell you that if that day been to focus on only one way to God can communicate with us. Watch this pastor call Y'all going to preach this. Y'all going to study this. Are you ready? Yeah. Look what it says. 1 Corinthians 14 says, Now, brethren, if I come with you, speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I, look what it says, shall speak to you either by, what's that first one? Revelation. By revelation. What's that second one? Knowledge. By knowledge. What's that third one? By prophesying, what's that fourth one? Doctrine. By doctrine, beloved. I'm telling you that we are doctrine-oriented people. Yeah. We are doctrine-oriented people, and we're scared to death of revelation. Hmm. <laughs> Let me tell you why. You know what revelation is? Revelation is information that can't be substantiated in the Bible. What's the last book of the Bible called? Revelation. It's called Revelation. Where was John? He's out in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And this is what the Lord told me. Where do you go to the Bible to prove? He said, now I saw Jesus standing in the midst of seven candles. Said, what scripture? You? He said, now John, you got to show me that. You had to show me where Jesus is standing in the midst of seven candlesticks. He said, I can't. It was a revelation. Hmm. I can't show it to you. Hmm. Beloved, God says we've got to have a walk with the Lord. <laughs> so when you can't back up what I'm saying with scripture, you know what we need? That, then you got to back up what I'm saying with my life. Y'all don't hear what the Lord said. Mm -hmm. not, not the life that I show, the life that you see. Mm -hmm. Somebody hear what I said. I, I'm not talking about how I dress. I'm not talking about how I'm cool. First John, First John 4, 1 says that you need to try the spirit. Mm -hmm. See, you can know what I'm saying is the truth when you can know what spirit is saying it through me. Did y'all catch that? This is what revelation is. We're bound up. We're not free because we put God in a box and tell him how he's got to operate with us. You got to come through a scripture for me, Lord. I said, wow, but I don't have a scripture to give you. Why is it that every entity in your Bible had a human instrument that could give them direction from the Lord and we don't have one? Hmm. Why have we bought the belief that Ellen White was the last one? Hmm. Joe says he's going to raise up some more. Hmm. In the last days, they'll go. Are we in the last day? Absolutely. <laughs> well, shouldn't we be looking for somebody? <laughs> shouldn't we be saying, Lord, like Isaiah, here am I, send me. Can I have a vision? Can I have a dream? And God says, can I have a life? Hmm. If you want a vision, show me a life that's worthy of a vision. Mm. If you want a dream, if you want to prophesy, show me a heart. Beloved, this is the religious liberty from the heart that God is after. There is so much God wants to do for West Side SDA, but we're going to have to get free in our hearts for God to do what he wants to do, what he raised this church up for, what he raised you up individually for. Before we can be free in our homes, before we can be free in our church, we've got to have religious liberty Amen. in our hearts. Amen. I've got to close. Isaiah 30, 21 says, well, you hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. 
Now remember, remember, remember when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. Now remember his way is in the sanctuary. Is that what, is that what Psalm 77 and 13 says? Because John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what he's saying is if Jesus is the way, and not if he's the way, he is the way. And he says the way is in the sanctuary. God says, I put the sanctuary down here as a visual aid, not to show you my journey, but to show you my way, to show you my character. Amen. What does that mean? John 10, 9, Jesus says, I'm the door. So you come through the door, a relationship. First John 4, 8 says, God is love, right? So when you come in, the very first thing you see is that altar of sacrifice. And you say, do you love me enough to die for me in your heart? Then you go through the next door where you see what? The table of showbread and the altar of incense and, candle of, and, 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 and the candlestick. And he says, do you love me enough to live for me? Oh, but there's another door. You go through that last door and there's nothing there. Hallelujah. But the Shekinah glory. And he says, do you love, do you love me enough to let me overtake you completely and you become me and I become you? Mm -hmm. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not my faith anymore. See, our problem is we're relying, watch this, on our good joy and our good peace and our good faith. And God says, the level where we're getting ready to fight, your best faith isn't going to be good enough. Your best joy is not going to be good enough. Your best forgiveness and mercy isn't going to be good enough. You're going to have to transition where it's my faith and my joy and my love and my hope, my freedom. This is what it means when he says, whom the son makes free. He didn't say set free. Amen. 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 Whom the son makes free. He's free indeed. And that freedom, beloved, it has to start in your heart. Mm -hmm. Let's bow for prayer. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you would come place a liberty in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.